Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest today, Dr. and Professor Sam Gandy from the Icon School of Medicine. Sam, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. It's great having you on the show. Uh, you, of course, uh, are a professor in Alzheimer's disease research, uh, neurology, and psychiatry. That's an interesting combination. How did you come up with that? Well, um, Alzheimer's is sort of shared between neurology and psychiatry. Um, it's sort of split between the pathology that the neurologists uh, think about and the clinical psychosis and dementia that, uh, that geriatric psychiatrists think about. Uh, and the medications that we use are sort of uh, split in specialty, so it's useful to have both of those together. We actually have the clinic co-staffed by neurologists and psychiatrists. So you also uh, were the person who discovered the first drugs that could lower the formation of amyloids. Uh, which uh, the a protein which clogs the brain and is uh, typically found in Alzheimer's patients. I mean, that's an extraordinary discovery, I would think. Well, uh, certainly at the time it was uh, it was it was quite novel. Uh, since then, we've learned a lot more about the molecular biology, about the enzymes that that make the uh, make the am amyloid protein. We were able to identify the main regulatory step that turns the, the process on, and then turn that off. Uh, so we were the first to be able to to, to shut that down. So uh, whether uh, it's tau tangles or whatever in my head, you have the ability to uh, stop stop the growth of those. Well, for amyloid, there's actually pretty good uh, there are pretty good medications. Tau, we're just getting to now. That's that's the new frontier. All right. You also are the director of the Center for Cognitive Health and uh, are the director of the NFL's Neurological Care Center uh, at Mount Sinai. So I want to talk about uh, that as well and, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy as well. Sure. Because CTE is another area uh, that you specialize in. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're, you cover a lot of territory. Well, uh, CTE and Alzheimer's share a lot. I mean, they're, the, the tau tangles are, are characteristic of both. Um, and the interesting thing about CTE is that we can often determine when the disease begins. The challenge with Alzheimer's is that the amyloid pathology can begin up to 30 years before symptoms, so it's hard to time uh, the intervention. So tell me, what is, uh, in terms of Alzheimer's, what is the disease exactly? How would you describe it? So Alzheimer's is the main disease that causes the syndrome that doctors call dementia. And literally, dementia means loss of the ability to think, loss of the ability to mentate, dement. It's characterized by disorders of memory, uh, cognition, and executive function. It's a progressive uh, disorder of the cortex, the outer shell of, of the brain. That's ultimately fatal over about 10 years. Why is it fatal? Um, as the disease progresses in its, in its later stages, uh, people uh, lose there as the cortex is lost, uh, then all that's remaining with the brain are the lower uh, brain stem functions uh, that, that control uh, breathing and, and uh, heart rate. So they take to bed, they have sleep-wake cycles, and they're in what's called a vegetative state. And because they're in bed and uh, don't uh, ventilate well, they often get pneumonia, bed sores, uh, urinary infections, and it's usually the infection that kills. Alzheimer's doesn't directly kill. All right, yeah, so that, that was kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. So it, it literally creates the conditions which make it conducive for you to get something that ultimately kills you. Correct. And that's part of why it's been uh, sort of underestimated. You may have heard uh, MMWR in the past month or so uh, reported this tremendous uh, leap in, uh, in Alzheimer's prevalence. And a lot of that was due to actually now listing it on death certificates because there's been a tendency for physicians to just list the proximate cause of death as either pneumonia or cardiac arrest and not include the Alzheimer diagnosis. And when does that change occur when Alzheimer's was being included? As the, as the disease has been recognized over the past 30 years, I think that it sort of trickled down to the, to the physicians and um, pathologists who are making the, uh, performing the, the, uh, the death uh, pronunciation. Um, so it's, it was, the disease was actually there for a long time. Uh, the, one of the challenges or one of the things that sort of slowed its recognition was that the first patient described by Alzheimer in 1907 was a 55-year-old woman. And so even when I was in medical school, Alzheimer's was thought to be a rare disease of midlife. It was only in the 70s and 80s when the pathology of this rare disease of midlife was recognized to be the same as what was causing dementia in all these millions of people in nursing homes. So what are the symptoms? Well, so the symptoms um, can, can begin in, in one of various ways. The most famous is the loss of short-term memory. Uh, 
the ability to form and retrieve new short-term memories. Often people can re remember their childhood in great detail, but they can't tell you what they had for breakfast or what month it is. Uh, and that's sort of a, a, a characteristic feature of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, repeating the same uh, information in a, in a single conversation and not recognizing that you're repeating it, that's a, also a, a, for a characteristic uh, piece. Um, other things that we, um, uh, we use to, to notice, people um, forget to pay bills, people... Um, I, I know a lot of people who forget to pay bills. Um, but um, for months at a time, or pay them multiple times. Um, uh, it's okay to sort of miss the, the day of the week or the date, but if you miss the month and the year and the season, that's unusual, that's usually uh, abnormal. How about, uh, I know people frequently you know, forget where their car keys are. Not a big deal, I assume. Um, that's right. I mean, what we usually tell people is that if you forget where your keys are and then eventually remember or find them, that's pretty normal. But if you have the keys in your hand and don't recognize them and don't know what to do with them, that's not normal. How about if you forget the name of a close friend, a very close friend? Names are the most challenging thing to remember because there's no reasoning to them, there's no logic. Um, close friends, I would think you would remember their names, but um, it's not unusual for people to lose names uh, as they age. So uh, talk about some of the effects of the disease. I mean, you, well, you talked about the ultimate effects. I mean, you've mentioned dementia. What, what else happens to you? And, and what's the, uh, two questions, kind of what's the progression uh, what's the time frame, uh, and why is it so difficult to diagnose early? Okay. Three um, questions. Right. Is that okay? That's fine. Can you remember all three? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, the syndrome that usually uh, begins the process is called mild cognitive impairment. And that's when there are things that are a little wrong, uh, maybe with, with cognition, with, um, with reasoning, or with remembering, uh, but you're able to compensate. You often have insight into the problem and are able to, to comp you write yourself notes or, or whatever and, and compensate. Or work around it somehow. Exactly. Um, when, that line, when you cross the line from MCI, mild cognitive impairment, to dementia, is when that, uh, whatever the cognitive impairment is, either the memory disorder or the executive function disorder, that is, is interfering with your daily function. You can't get through your daily life without help. Uh, and that's the, that's, that's the early sign, that's mild dementia. Um, the difficulty in, in diagnosing uh, is the, uh, the number of diseases that cause similar uh, syndromes in, the, in late life and aging. So, so the, the challenge in, in diagnosis has been the confusion with other dementias of late life. Though Alzheimer's causes about two-thirds of all dementia, there are several other diseases, uh, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, that can easily be uh, dis uh, mistaken for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in addition, uh, there's an entity called vascular dementia, where multiple strokes can cause dementia. That, none of these uh, con uh, contain or uh, develop amyloid plaques. Amyloid plaques are the signature of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but vascular disease is very common and increases the risk for Alzheimer's. So there are many people who have vo both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. About 70% of the African American population, for example, with, with dementia have both diseases. And how, in terms of vascular uh, dementia, uh, how does that occur? How does that evolve, especially, obviously, as it relates to what circulatory system and and, and I mean, if it's vascular, I'm assuming that. Right, so we say for, for both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease, in terms of prevention, the things that are good for your heart are good for your brain. Uh, control your cholesterol, your body weight, your sugar, your, your blood pressure. Also for Alzheimer's disease, mental stimulation is important, social engagement is important, physical exercise is very important for, uh, for both. Making a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is still challenging. Uh, now that we have uh, brain scans that can visualize the pathology, we've discovered that about a third of patients with clinical Alzheimer's disease and shrunken brains uh, have no amyloid that we can detect. Really? So we don't know exactly what those folks have yet. Um, and that, that's been a challenge, obviously, for uh, inter intervention with amyloid-reducing agents because you would predict that those folks with no amyloid would not, re would not respond to amyloid-reducing drugs. Do they? Um, uh, I mean, it's possible they could, even though the drugs may be having an effect on something else. So, so now, uh, having a positive amyloid scan is a requirement for getting into the trial. Uh, 
Oh, really? So those, uh, those patients without al amyloid will be studied sort of independently. Um, and they have been tested with, with uh, anti-amyloid uh, medications, but only at sort of later stages. Now, the challenge of amyloid reducing agents is the, uh, the initiation of amyloidosis 30 years before symptoms began. Uh, and that's been a, uh, you know, a real challenge in, in terms of um, predicting what's going to happen uh, to people and making, the, making that diagnosis because not everyone who has amyloid will develop Alzheimer's disease. In fact, it's possible to die with a complete pathological picture of Alzheimer's disease, plaques, tangles, and the whole thing, and be absolutely clinically normal on the day that you die. We know that then that there are ways to compensate for that pathology. We don't understand them as well as we do the pathology, but uh, that's another important uh, area of research. So some people can compensate, others cannot. That's correct. And uh, how about when, when we come back, I want to talk about uh, the timeline in terms of the uh, chronological progression of the disease typically. But I'd also be interested in what studies have been done in terms of uh, genetic markers or the ability to say you have the you know, high a probability of developing amyloids or, uh, or whatever. So we're going to be right back with Dr. Gandhi in just a moment. The Rexile Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbour. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbour Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos and tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Dr. Sam Gandhi from the Icon School of Medicine. So Sam, one of the things we were talking about is, is the timeline, the progression. What, what's a typical uh, timeline in terms of progression and, and what are kind of the, the, the key milestones? Often symptoms will be present for several years before patients ever uh, come to see the physician. Maybe a year, maybe two years. Any age kind of range? Uh, so, so we generally diagnose Alzheimer's after age 65. That's sort of the, the rule. But generally, most patients are older than 70 or 75. They're in their late 70s or 80s. Oh, good. I have a long way to go then. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, so the disease usually progresses over about a decade. The average length of time from diagnosis to death is 10 years. That's pretty short. It is. Um, and uh, not everyone um, uh, dies that quickly, especially now that um, medical care and support is much better. There are plenty of, of um, Alzheimer's patients, for example, Ronald Reagan, who lived 15 or more years after his diagnosis. So it's, it's not um, unusual for uh, people to live longer, but 10 has been the average in, the, in, in most studies. I assume that average is likely to go up. I think it will, yes. Um, so uh, the, the, the first few years are really the, the mild cognitive impairment years, uh, the conversion from MCI to Alzheimer's, to mild dementia. Now, not everyone with MCI will develop dementia. Some will stay at the MCI stage. So you plateau in for the rest of your life at, at mild cognitive impairment. That's right. Um, we're not quite sure why it, 
what um, determines who will progress and who won't, I mean, clinically. Uh, but it's clear that you, you don't necessarily need to move from, from MCI to, to dementia. Um, so the, uh, the mild dementia stage um, usually requires um, supervision uh, to keep people safe throughout the day because since they can't form and retrieve new memories, they often will leave the stove on, they'll wander and won't be able to get home. Uh, disorientation and familiar uh, surroundings. Don't give me the car keys. Uh, driving is a big problem. Uh, taking away the car keys uh, is, is, a, is a big challenge because that represents a real loss of independence uh, and is very disruptive uh, for, the, for the family and the patient, but um, often must be done, is usually done by the, often done by the physician uh, because of the sort of the unpleasant uh, uh, connotations around it. But, but driving is a, is a big issue, especially in a rural area like this where there's no um, uh, public transportation to, to um, you know, sort of get through the day with uh, uh, normal amenities. Maybe autonomous vehicles will help uh, people with uh, impairment. Uh, well, that, that's a reasonable. Of course, you have to remember where you're going and where you need to go back to. Right. Uh, I mean, there, there still are some, some memory um, uh, points that are, that are required. So the, the progression over the, sort of the first half of the illness involves loss of, of multiple uh, regions of the cortex as they de degenerate. As I said, um, uh, forgetfulness is the sort of the most famous forget, uh, initial symptom, but changes in personality can be uh, uh, present. Again, uh, loss of, of executive function, sort of um, unable to, to um, manage things in three-dimensional space, uh, problems with navigation, um, with getting around. Any typical uh, trend in terms of personality changes? Uh, is it just across the board or is it, is, are there some directions that are more dominant? Um, I would say that about, about half go one way and half go the other. And, and about half, um, the, the um, sort of outgoing people will become more withdrawn. Uh, often aggressive people will become more, uh, more uh, tolerant and more uh, sort of mild-mannered. Uh, on the other hand, there are about half in whom their, their, sort of their bad traits get worse, they dominate, and they're very difficult to, uh, to manage. So, so the net effect is probably not positive overall. Um, right, because the, the uh, withdrawal actually, because you're withdrawing from the social uh, engagement, accelerates the progression of the disease. So that's actually uh, not, a good, not a good sign. There's often loss of insight. And those folks are also very difficult to, um, to, to take care of because they think nothing is wrong. And for the entire illness, they will not be able to see the illness. They will think they will, they will fight tooth and nail for the whole time. They'll refuse their medications, uh, be difficult to supervise, um, often wander and, be, and, uh, and get lost. Uh, that's a, those are, are very challenging patients, but not unusual. Any way to convince somebody like that? Could you, could you video somebody uh, and show them? what they're doing? Absolutely not. It's a neurological issue. It's an agnosia. It's like when people have a stroke in certain areas can't recognize a part of their body. They can't see the illness. They have, an, they have a neurological agnosia for the illness. You cannot convince them. It's not, it's not possible. Fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, what, what a challenging situation. But as you can imagine, uh, those are folks who are brought in by loved ones. They don't come in because they don't think there's anything wrong. Um, and so the challenge begins right then. Uh, they're often you know, hostile to the physician at the beginning because they think you know, they're, they're there against their will. Right. I'm fine. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, a, that's incredible. I had not realized that. Yeah. Okay, finish the progression. So, so uh, about midway through, um, sort of the, the uh, changes include psychosis uh, and agitation, uh, loss of control of bowel and bladder. And those are the things that usually prompt institutionalization. Um, though people may stay at home with uh, family or um, other sort of caregivers, once uh, incontinence begins and agitation and behavior is hard to control, that's often the turning point uh, into nursing home uh, placement. Uh, the progression from there to the end is really a, a loss of, of cortical function. Uh, they'll, be, they'll spend more and more time sitting uh, and then more and more time in the bed. Uh, and they'll stop eating, uh, which also becomes a decision point as to how to, whether to feed them or, or not. Um, You're and, talking about with, intravenously? Uh, um, intravenously or with a, gastro, uh, a gastric tube. They often put um, tubes through the skin into the stomach uh, to feed elderly people who can't eat on their own. Wow. But that's a, 
that's a commitment because that's then a, a sort of life-sustaining intervention that is, uh, if once a cortical function is lost, then you have to make a, an active decision to withdraw that. Uh, and often withdrawal is more complicated depending on the institution where you are than uh, never initiating. So the, to the end of the disease, um, people are in bed. Um, yeah, going back to that, I mean, if never initiating, uh, you've made a decision, withdrawal, you're making uh, That's a, an active a, process. A, right, right. So I, c I can see the difference, difference in those two. Extra, well, tough, both are tough, but that second decision would be really difficult well, for most people. I mean, you probably remember the Karen Ann Quinlan sure. uh, case. That was a withdrawal, and the institution um, was against withdrawal. And had, had the tube never been placed, then she would have you know, met her end uh, sort of in a timely manner. Right. But she was sustained by this, uh, this tube that the family wanted to withdraw, uh, and the institution refused to withdraw, um, pending the, the, the court decision. Right, yeah, no, a very political uh, matter too, as I recall. Yes, yeah. Um, and at, at the end, uh, there's, it's what we call a uh, persistent vegetative state. People don't like that term because vegetative and vegetable tends to see it's sort of a negative connotation. Um, it's, um, you may have heard of this um, uh, boy that just returned from, from North Korea sure. who was <clears throat> in a vegetative state. Out of warm beer. Exactly. Uh, but they gave it a, a new name, um, unconscious wakefulness. Uh, which was a new constellation of, of description that had never been sort of used before, but clearly they were avoiding using the word vegetative uh, in this high-profile case. But that was the same, the same syndrome. Um, the, the eyes will be open, uh, they'll have sleep-wake cycles, uh, but they'll never engage with their environment. Uh, they may withdraw to pain, uh, but they don't, uh, they, they don't speak. Um, they, they're totally, um, their, their cortex is, is, is destroyed. And as we discussed before, the end is usually due to a, a, uh, an infectious uh, etiology due to the, to the debilitation, to, the, to being bedridden. And so, uh, so in the end, you've, I mean, you've lost function uh, and you're, you've become more susceptible to uh, other factors which ultimately kill you. Right. But Alzheimer's itself doesn't or can it? Well, the, the, Could the deterioration get to the point where actually uh, uh, critical functions shut off, or is that really not ever the case? That's really not ever the case. Um, the part of the, the brain that runs the heart and lungs is in the, what's called the brain stem, just above the spinal cord. And the thalamus, the, sort of the deep cortical gray uh, areas, and the brain stem tend to be spared. So it's very unusual for Alzheimer's to directly destroy a brain stem. It usually destroys the cortex and hippocampus, but not the sort of deeper structures. A design for survival. Um, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, no, but of, not a happy survival. Right. Right. Okay, we're going to be right back with Dr. Gandhi in our final segment of part one of our special two-part series with him. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of the Aaron Harbour Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. 
Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Dr. Sam Gandhi from the Icon School of Medicine. We're talking about Alzheimer's, and this is part one of our special two-part series, so make sure you watch part two as well. So uh, go ahead. You, you were talking about uh, how people react to the disease. I was just saying that, that the public tends to think of Alzheimer's and sort of the way it's portrayed in disease of, of the week or movie of the week uh, as a uh, sort of annoying forgetfulness, but uh, not the fatal disease that it actually is. I think part of the reason that uh, the you know, legislators aren't as compelled by it is because they have this uh, association of just the memory disorder and not the fatal disorder uh, that, that actually kills. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the later stages of the, of the disease are uh, hidden from view, and many people in the, pu in the public don't recognize that it's a, a fatal uh, disease. They think of it in terms of the sort of movie of the week portrayal where there's an annoying memory disorder, but they don't really follow it to the end. Uh, but it's, uh, and this, this may, be, may contribute to why uh, legislators haven't yet sort of grasped the compelling uh, nature of the problem. By 2050, the entire Medicare budget will be required to pay for only Alzheimer's. There'll be no money for cancer and heart disease. All right, so, uh, and part of it is the end stage isn't very pretty. That's right. It's, uh, it's, and, and so I think you don't see that portrayal as often. How about uh, genetics in terms of markers, predicting, uh, testing? Where, where are we with all that? When, when are we gonna know uh, when I'm 12 years old uh, whether or not I have a high probability for Alzheimer's? Well, there are some rare forms of Alzheimer's that have an early onset, usually in the 40s or 50s, but can be as early as 18, uh, in which the disease is just like Huntington's. It's a, there's a mutation in the DNA, and it can be detected from the moment of conception. So 12 years old would be no, no challenge. Um, that only represents a few percent of all of Alzheimer's, however. That's maybe one to three percent. There are mutations in the genes for the amyloid protein that build up in the, in the brain or in the enzymes that form amyloid. That's the, where, the, these, where the genetic disruption is in these early onset cases. Now, sort of more relevant to most people uh, in the public is that half of Alzheimer's is associated with a high risk gene. And that gene is called ApoE4. It's the main cholesterol transport protein in the body. But this, but this is a, a change in the DNA. It's not called a mutation uh, because uh, having the ApoE4, which is the high risk uh, form, doesn't guarantee you get the disease. It only increases your risk. How much? Everyone gets two copies of each gene, uh, one from each parent. Uh, each copy of ApoE4 triples the risk. So it's not unusual or certainly possible for, to have one copy of ApoE4 and escape Alzheimer's disease. What's the standard risk percentage-wise, probability-wise? So, so normally, uh, the ApoE4 is in about 15% of the normal population, but in about 45% of the Alzheimer population. Okay, so uh, what's the risk of getting in the general population, uh, if you don't have uh, the gene, what's the uh, probability of getting Alzheimer's? Well, it's, uh, the, it's aging dependent, and by age 85, half of the general population have a dementia, usually Alzheimer's disease. So that's, uh, by 85, it's about one in two. The, the ApoE4 causes the pathology to begin earlier. All right, we're gonna take a long break because this is the end of part one of our two-part series with Dr. Gandhi. Make sure you watch part two. I'm Aaron Harbour, thanks for watching. Thank you.